talking a little bit about how we can um, structure tasks in an autism assessment clinic. Um, same ideas work well in teaching children with autism so that we can really learn more about their skills so that they don't uh, succumb to their um, their characteristic disability. Of course, the classic three areas of, of difficulty that children with autism have in the area of social interactions, interactions with peers, um, communication, sometimes to the point of no spoken communication, um, and, and then a very narrow or restricted range of interests. Um, and if you look closely at those, you can see that some real specific difficulties are associated with them. One, of course, in the area of joint attention, um, and in terms of assessment and teaching, joint attention, focusing on a task, either a visual task or a written task, together with another person or with a group of people is kind of key to our whole learning and assessment process. And that's challenging to people um, with autism. Also, not much motivation for things that they didn't choose to do, um, that, that aren't preferred. Um, verbal input um, to people with autism is often not attended to. Their ability to express themselves um, can be clarified um, if you use AAC, as Pat and her colleagues have been teaching us for years. Um, sometimes their expression is um, mixed up with well, it's not mixed up. It's intentionally learned problem behavior that becomes a way to communicate um, different things that they want because their um, other ways of communicating aren't attended to or understood. Change is an issue. Um, if I'm doing this and I like what I'm doing, I don't want to drop this and go to the next thing. Um, and that's somewhat linked to being able to um, stop what it is they're doing and it's also um, link to um, planning. And then preoccupa preoccupation with um, their patterns of interest that are, that are very restricted. So one way of, I think a lot of our colleagues in psychology tend to focus, at least my experience is that they focus so much so on the, the deficits. Um, in fact, in the field of intellectual disability, we've been a deficit-focused um, discipline, I think, for way too many years and fail to look at the other, other side of the coin. Um, these challenges are accompanied by strengths. Um, <clears throat> strengths in terms of being able to process visual information perhaps better than processing auditory information. Being attentive to details. Um, having sensory perception, which all of these can get in the way, but they also can be viewed as strengths and made use of. Um, simple memory for things, being able to learn rules and systems for structuring work and moving through a schedule of activities, and being able, being very oriented to routines. So these are some of the challenges that we uh, try to build on in this clinic. Um, executive function is a theoretical construct for um, how the brain organizes a lot of cognitive functions, a lot of cognitive abilities. Um, planning, anticipating, um, organizing, predicting, inhibiting. Inhibition, being able to stop one's behavior at the appropriate time and move on to the next thing is something that is challenging for people with, with autism. Um, attention, being able to shift attention kind of goes hand in hand with um, inhibition. Um, being able to freely move your attention to the next activity. Um, which kind of goes hand in hand with planning and self-monitoring. Um, emotional control, I have some things going on inside and I see that I need to uh, monitor my own behavior and bring it under control. Um, planning for what's coming next um, uh, and so on. So all of the, the working memory one, before I came here I realized that one of my credit cards has a tendency to be canceled if I all of a sudden show up in a foreign country and start charging things. So I thought, oh, I better call them. Um, so you call and you, they give you a menu of eight things and you're not really sure which one it is until you get to the end. Then you have to remember, yeah, it sounds close to two. So then you push <laughs> two and then they give you another menu of five things. And so this working memory thing can be taxing 
even to those of us that, that don't have disabilities that might make that difficult. Um, being able to impose a certain order um, on materials in your office, in your, your homework assignment, you're writing a paper, um, your work, your play, um, and self-monitoring. How am I doing? Um, and how, does it, how am I doing right now? And how does it compare to a certain standard that I might want to achieve? So these are some of the many um, cognitive um, abilities that some people view as being under um, the executive functioning um, organization of the brain. Um, and we need to call on these whenever we're presented with the unexpected, whenever we have to really concentrate, um, hard, adapt, change. Um, so you could go through some tasks like picking the correct clothes based on the weather, which is an important thing here. Um, so we need to absorb some information, process it, interpret it, and make decisions. So those cognitive processes all go into these various tasks. So um, a number of researchers talk about there being cognitive, um, excuse me, executive dysfunction in certain groups of people, um, individual on the autism spectrum, some with ADHD, um, some with learning disabilities. These are really broad um, statements, hard to prove. Um, there aren't really clear-cut ways to observe or test all of these executive function um, abilities. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting way to think about how some of their difficulties um, come to... Uh, come to uh, prevent them from doing things that you and I might want them to do as teachers or as assessors. Um, also, it's been identified or it's been said that executive dysfunction exists in people with um, obsessive compulsive disorder, with clinical levels of depression, and I think that last one's kind of interesting. Um, developmentally, these things aren't there from the get-go. Um, they develop, they um, so some two-year-olds obviously don't have the same level of um, some of these cognitive abilities or executive function. Those three core deficits tend to contribute to their challenges around planning and organizing and predicting and self-monitoring. So back to the point of, of the talk today, um, using visual structure and structured work are two ways that we can um, help counter some of these core deficits. It's, it's helpful to use visual supports, helpful to use structured teaching, and I'll talk real precisely about the, those in order to bypass some of these and build on the strengths. So we're building on visual skills, we're helping focus attention, we build in a routine, and, and we present things in an organized fashion. So here's Kyle. Um, he's learned, uh, here, here's his schedule, um, and this is just for the morning, um, and he's learned that he takes an item off, um, and he um, puts it, actually he takes it and he matches it to the location in the room, and this is a resource room. He also spends part of his day in kindergarten. Um, and so he takes this little blue circle, which is his work time, and goes to a location in the room where he sits down with his teacher and does some work and learns some new things. Um, his work time at that desk during blue circle time is also organized within. He has three folders. You can't really see it, but there's a shelf over there, one folder on each shelf. He opens the folder up. There's some work he has to do here. When he finishes it, he moves it to the finished side, puts it on the shelf, gets the next one. Um, so he can visually tell how much he has to do, where he is, and when he's done. And when he's done with the last folder, he goes back to his schedule and um, gets the next thing, which is um, a picture of a computer. And he sits down and um, works on the computer for a while, a preferred activity. OK, this is the assessment group that um, I mentioned. We really just started in January, but prior to that time, this group of faculty um, were exploring um, 
kind of combining with an existing autism clinic where they assess lots and lots of children. And this is at UVA, part of the hospital, Children's Rehab Center. Um, we knew that they tended to do kind of a limited assessment. And by limited, there, was, there were five or six doctors um, who did the assessment. Um, one doctor did most of them, MD. Um, and it, it consisted of really sitting down with the parent parents and the child and within an hour's time of interaction coming up with the um, diagnosis, sharing the diagnosis with them on the spot um, and then sending them off with a recommendation that they should, they should go to Virginia Institute for Autism and, um, which is a separate school. You know, and this really bothered a lot of us and so we <laughs> approach them saying, you know, maybe we can join forces and we can broaden out your assessment. Um, wouldn't it be useful to have a, a, an accurate reading of the child's reading ability, their math ability, um, their all other aspects of um, psychological testing? Wouldn't it be useful to do some uh, communication assessment? Um, if they have problem behavior, wouldn't it be helpful to define that problem behavior? And, you know, all the things that we do, okay? And they said, yeah, yeah, it might be. So for a couple of years, we tried to work with them. Um, but it, it wasn't as successful as we thought it would be. Um, so meanwhile, the School of Education is building a new building, and they, on their ground floor, open a center which has lots of clinics in it, all of which are kind of long-term existing clinics. And we thought, let's, let's go ahead and do it on our own, and we'll do it without an MD. Um, so that's what, and we've really just gotten started in January. So far, we've only seen five children. Our age group is from three to probably 21, but we might do older than that. Um, we have um, this Diane Tellerico Cavanaugh, who's a, with the public schools, as I mentioned earlier. We have a couple of postdoc students. This is one of them, and then a lot of doc students. So it's, a, it's kind of an extended team. Um, we have a series of things we do um, with each potential client. Um, first, intake screening. Is this a person who we think we could help um, through this assessment? Do they really seem suitable? Would they be better off in another clinic? Um, uh, so there's get the referral, do some phone interviews. We decide whether or not that seems like a reasonable um, uh, individual to assess. Um, then here, after we assign a case manager, we conduct a detailed parent telephone interview. Um, and let me just show you that. Is, you cannot read it in your handout, I'm sure. You probably can't read it here either. <laughs> okay. But um, the questions I've kind of put in the box are the ones that are particularly interesting to me as a special educator. Um, I tend to work with the behavioral assessment part of it. So what are, the, what are the child's interests? What motivates them? How do they spend their free time? Um, are they things that the child doesn't want to end? Like the last little boy we saw, it was Lego. Or Star Wars, playing with Star Wars figures. Um, and that's how he spent all of his free time. And it was at the end of summer, and that's pretty much all he did all summer. Um, and that was what motivated him. <laughs> And he'd line up his Lego things. And, um, and the concerns in terms of communication, how does your child communicate, to give us a feel for how we might interact with a child or how we might build our structured materials so that the child can use them. Um, and school performance, just generally, so we can get a feel for where we would start some of the assessments getting along with others, and problem so behavior. So that detailed parent interview gives us the kind of information that we need to do this part where the team without the parent meets and we figure out, okay, what assessments make sense for this child um, and um, who's going to be involved and how are we going to arrange it um, and affirming a, a date. We create the visual supports and structure that I think some of these some of these are a little different because I, of course, went through after I sent it to Pat and found I left this out and I left that out. So don't be bothered if your handout's a little different. 
um, then um, set up the assessment day. And the ADOS um, is something that we do first, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. I don't know if that's something that you guys use up here. Um, we do that without the structured visual schedule, um, in part because the, the two people that give it want to see their performance within just the structure of the test rather than imposing additional structure. Um, of course, the special educator in me says, you know, why do you want this kid to, you know, to not know what's going on? So I have a hard time with that, but I understand why. As soon as that's done, then we take the kid aside and we do a little bit of training. Then we return to assessment using the visual supports. Um, then the assessment day is over. We score, write up, submit. The team analyzes the findings. Um, we discuss diagnosis, whether or not it seems suitable. Um, the last little boy that we assessed, um, we decided based on his scores, both on a lot of parent, um, uh, parent reports that are filled out, teacher reports that are filled out, as well as the direct assessment, um, that, he, that we didn't put him on the spectrum. Well, we gave the diagnosis of um, uh, PDD and OS, um, which I understand is not going to be, it might not it's be. It's on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, it's on the spectrum, right, but, um, and ADHD. Um, so there's usually a lot of discussion around there, and other people on the team are very equipped to, um, they done a lot of assessment to make those kinds of decisions, but we make it as a team. We meet with the parents. Um, right now it's assessment um, rather than uh, assessment and intervention. The hope is that in the future that they'll, it will include intervention. I think that's much more satisfactory for those of us on the team who like to move on from assessment. Um, but we do do possible follow-up home school visits. Um, that would be carried out after the meeting. And then this is the part that I'm the most familiar with that I tend to do. Um, so we do a FBA, Functional Behavioral Assessment, um, but only when the parent indicates that, that there really are problems and that come through in the interview. Um, so this is a version of Russell and Horner. It's a um, version of facts. I don't know if any of you use the facts. It's kind of a downward extension So, for preschoolers. So instead of having in the, on the checklist up at the top the problems that you check, the facts has things like steals and cusses and uses drugs. You know, this one <laughs> doesn't have that. It has like hits, hits kids over the head with toys, you know, stuff like that. Um, and um, then if we need the detail that you get from O'Neill's FAO or FAI, we use that. And then the MACE sometimes we use. These would be follow-up instruments if we do do an observation. Okay, so um, kind of shifting a little bit to teach um, really a philosophy of how to think about um, autism and people with autism developed in the 1970s by Eric Schlopler, Schopler. Um, and uh, it's, it's not really a, a, an intervention per se, it's more kind of a broad-based set of um, ways of thinking about autism, but there are components in the TEACH system that we can view as being intervention um, methods. The most commonly known are the visual schedules, visual activity schedules, and structured work systems. Uh, one thing I like, oh thank you, about their system is that uh, they have a way of kind of individualizing, um, so they have a set of variables that we'll look at that help you individualize a schedule for a person, because we all know they can be incredibly complex and therefore not meaningful, um, or they can be simplified to suit the, the child's um, abilities. So the assumption is that you can um, modify 
learning activities and opportunities to perform um, in ways that will avoid some of these difficulties that children with autism traditionally have. Um, and the goal is that you're going to help the child be independent of teacher prompts, which are so often verbal, sometimes verbal and gestural, um, by teaching them the structure. They list six elements of, teacher, of structured teaching. These are the ones that we tend to rely on most in the clinic. The activity sequence that's predictable, that mirrors the way the day is going to flow. Um, the, the visual schedule that um, communicates to the child what to do. And then we, we don't use all of the structured work systems. We use the simpler st structured work systems. Um, so structured work systems are supposed to answer four questions. What, what is my work? What am I supposed to be doing here? How much is required? When am I finished? And what happens next? Um, all of these things are things that you and I want to know. You know, you come in here, you know when this is going to end, um, and you know where you're going to go next. And if you didn't know where you were going to go next or you didn't know where it was going to end, you'd be worried about that. You'd be thinking about that. Um, you'd, you might not even want to come in here because you'd be concerned about what is going to happen next. Um, those are kind of ordinary questions that we know all the time. And when we don't know them, sometimes we don't know them, when we walk into a new situation, it's, it can consume us. Um, and we're not very comfortable, and it interferes with our attending. Um, so these are things that we build into the visual system so that, um, so that that's evident to a child. So, for example, William, his previous schedule was, you can tell it's been used a lot, it's kind of bent up, a folder um, with two rows of pictures um, and he would move through the rows and that would be part of his day. Actually, that's his whole day because here's the bus. Um, so he'd get the first item um, and he would put it, close up his schedule, put it on the front of his schedule and the blue circle meant going to work. He'd go over to the location, he'd match it, sit down and do his work with the teacher. Um, his current schedule um, he can, this is his current schedule. He still uses some pictures, but um, he can operate because he can read the words by um, having a list of things from top to bottom. The first thing he does on this particular part of the day, this may not be the whole day, is goes to star activities. Star activities is a reinforcement time. Um, then he goes to blue where he works and um, can't read that one. Then he goes to bathroom. If things come up that we need to insert, they will, oh, I think that's breakfast. They will add those things in. When he does it, he crosses it out. Um, so this is blue. This is the work time with the teacher. Um, and even within that work time, there's a structure so that he knows what is my work, how much do I have to do, when am I finished, what comes next. So there are a lot of options for um, visually structuring a student's work. And the simplest is first then, or now next, you may call it that. There's a countdown system that's also pretty simple. Um, a visual schedule is another way that you can structure work. And some, what we call a work activity system. All of these things will answer those questions. So they all have that um, that information built in. So here's an example of first then. Um, William went to his schedule and it said PE. So he got the PE thing, probably put it on the front of his schedule, um, and then he went to PE. When he gets to PE, um, he has a real hard time initiating. What do I do first? He wants to do only the things that he likes to do. Um, so they use a simple, first we're gonna do this, um, bouncing on the ball, which is what he's doing, and then we're going to do um, pushing on the wheelie board. So what do I have to do? What are my tasks? These two. What do I do first? This one. What comes next? That one. When am I done? When they're both um, pulled off and on the back. Here's another first then structure. Um, he's at his independent workstation. Um, 
doing things. Kind of the one way teach um, sets up things is they have a teacher present workstation in the resource room where new things are taught to the child. And the new things ideally come from the inclusive classroom where they spend part of their day um, or maybe all of their day. But So the new things are brought into this workspace and taught to the child. Um, and then in the independent workspace, um, he's pretty much on his own and he has his structure um, and he, he practices or extends some of those tasks. And then at that point, he's... He's ready, or um, more ready, more able to be able to function in the, with the same activities in the classroom. So his first then is first green, then motor. Uh, first yellow folder, I think it says, then motor. So he's, um, I don't know, he's working, let's say he's working on this one first, um, and then he's going to cross it out, or his teacher will come by and cross it out, and then he does his motor activity, then he comes back and does another one, and then he does his motor activity. The countdown systems was the second form of visual structure. Um, countdown systems uh, can be used to um, denote passage of time or number of things that you need to complete. So Kyle is in his um, activity, his kind of preferred activity, he's done some work already, goes to the computer, and this is the countdown system over here. And the teacher will, um, okay, you can do computer for five. Now, that doesn't mean five minutes. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean 50 minutes. It doesn't mean that each one of these is a unit of time that's distinct. Um, it means that it's a period of time, but uh, the teacher's going to come by and move the clothespin down Okay, Kyle, you've got four left. Okay, Kyle, you've got three. Um, if you're really close to the teacher monitors that were really close to time, okay, Kyle, two. Okay, now one. <laughs> okay, you're done. But uh, looking at this, he can judge where he is and roughly um, whether he has time left. It can also be used to stand for tasks. So when we were over at the rehab center, um, one of the things that was always in the assessment schedule was time with the, the doctor. And so the doctor might say, okay, there are, um, Kyle, there are four things that we're going to be doing here, um, and we have a countdown schedule, and now we're on four. First thing we're going to do is weigh you, so then we weigh. Okay, now we've done that, we move it to three. Now we're going to do your height. Okay, now we'll move it to two, we're going to do your blood pressure. Okay, now we'll move it to one, we'll do your temperature. So you're done, that kind of thing. So it can be either passage of time or tasks. Um, so visual schedule are, is something everyone, a lot of people in here have used. It doesn't have to be pictures, it doesn't have to be words. Just the easiest would be um, objects, either objects that are actual, um, actual things that are used in the activities or representations. Um, sometimes Schedules are faded or upgraded, but um, the general philosophy in teach is that you don't eliminate them. That Toby had some characteristics of autism, plus had measured with a pretty extensive intellectual disability, um, and he was using a, a visual object schedule. Uh, I think this is the afternoon, and he had functional objects here. This is playground. Anyone want to guess what's in there? Yeah, it was um, actually wood chips. The playground was covered with wood chips. So take them out. Um, I can't remember what that one was. Um, and then he had representational objects um, that he was learning. First, they were objects like there's a ball in there, a small ball. Um, and that stood for going to the gymnasium where he had a combined OT communication session. Um, and then they started, you'll see in a future, another slide, they started putting um, photographs on the object because they wanted to get rid of the object and kind of upgrade them a little bit. Um, okay, Teach has got a checklist for schedules and a checklist for work systems. And um, I find this to be pretty helpful in ways of thinking about the variables that are involved in making sure that... Um, a visual schedule is suited to a particular person. 
So we've already talked a little bit about the form of representation. Um, and uh, Toby used both objects that could be used in the activities and objects that were symbolic. Um, and then they were adding a photograph um, to the object. Um, the length of the schedule, is it going to go the full day? Or is it just going to be one item at a time, which is the way you'd start. That would be the simplest. Um, presentation format. Um, again, one in a left to right, top to bottom, multiple rows. Um, manipulating the schedule. Do you carry the object to use? Do you carry the visual cue? Do you turn it over? Do you cross it out? Um, where is the schedule? Does the teacher take the schedule to the student? Um, is it stationary on a table? Is it stationary on a wall or shelf? Um, is there a pull-off segment that you take? Is it on a clipboard? And there are more variations. Um, initiation of the use of the schedule. Does the teacher initiate it, or does the student go to the schedule with a transition symbol to get them to the schedule? That's where Toby was, I believe. Um, or do they travel using a verbal cue, or are they spontaneous? End of activity, go back to schedule, which is hanging on the wall like um, Kyle did. So let's look at Toby and then try to think of what characteristics are built into his schedule. <coughs> so he takes the first object that symbolizes the first activity. Um, the second one is art class. The third one is toileting, but let's just focus on the first. He goes to um, part of the the gym um, and works with his SLP to make an activity choice. So she has two items, which you can see a little bit better here, um, trampoline and radio. Um, this is the miniature of an item, and this is the thing they're trying to transfer his understanding to a photograph. Not the word so much. The word is so that they'll be consistent in calling it the same thing. And if you don't know that that's a, supposed to be a simulated trampoline, um, so you know what it is. So she'll hold up. It's a very nice choice arrangement. Um, hold up one. Do you want... I can't remember what that one is. Oh, that's a swing. Do you want the swing? Um, do you want the roller? Um, and holding them both up and waiting, and he needs to take. Um, and then they go to that location and play on it. Here's another um, representing fire drill, um, which is not a favorite activity for a lot of kids with autism. Um, it's noisy, it's crowded. We immediately have to drop what we're doing and we have to go someplace. Why? I don't know. You know, um, and uh, so having a sequence of pictures that represent um, and, and practicing it, um, that was coupled with um, a countdown because when we line up, we might have to stand there for five. Um, especially when we're outside and we line up in a circle, we might have to stand there for five. So you take this portable structure with you, and it allows um, it to go a little more smoothly. So we're after um, independence. Kids that don't have autism that can use a lot of their other abilities um, are going to learn a system without all of this kind of detail um, and can become independent. Um, so we're aiming again for the concrete, the visual sequence, to kind of bypass some of those executive function and poor communication skills, and we don't fade out or completely remove the structure. So he's on his way to lunch. He's gotten the lunch item. Um, the teacher gives him a work structure. Because lunch is one icon, okay? But it's also, you know, 45 different tasks. So this is the first part of his lunch schedule. She walks him through the line. He's just learning this, so um, I'm not sure what he looks like now. Um, she's reviewing it with him. Um, she crosses things out. Uh, well, wait, the first thing that they have to do is go to the bathroom, Go to Miss Daniels, that's the kindergarten, line up with the kindergarten, then go to the lunchroom, get your food, sit down, eat your lunch. That's all for the big schedule item of lunch. Um, so that's what they do. Go to the kindergarten. She's going through the lunch line with him. She's reviewing the schedule by just pointing to things. If he doesn't do it, she points to it. He gets up to the number, punch in your code number, and she just gives him a visual reminder.
And then he goes, and there's a Canadian bear. Is that a grizzly? Hi. Uh, finds his place to sit down, eats, and his teacher is still reviewing with him. And then she leaves. He finishes his lunch. Second teacher comes in with another, the other half of the scheduled steps. Um, and you can see she's, well, you can't see it. She's carrying, a, yeah, she's carrying a little list that she reviews if he forgets things. Um, and and ends up back in the kindergarten on the rainbow rug. The rainbow rug was difficult for him. He had a social narrative or a social story that he had been using for a couple of weeks. He also had a video model of him sitting on the rainbow rug. Um, he didn't like having all the people crowded around him. He didn't like the noise. Um, but he pretty much had mastered. He's looking pretty, pretty okay there. Um, so both the social narrative and the video model were two other forms of visual support um, that also have some research behind them. So just a little quick one on social narratives. I used like the term social narrative rather than social story because if you've read some of Gray's work, she has all these, got to have so many sentences, you got to have so many words in a sentence. You got to have there are a lot of characteristics that they build into it. You're shaking your head. That's the trademark. Yeah, it is a trademark, and you don't use social stories without putting little copyright. Um, but the problem is, it's a big package. And while the general concept seems to be effective, we don't know that you really have to have that many sentences and that many words. Um, so if you don't want to get sued and you're not following her rules. I think use social narrative. Um, but it's really a nice, simple system that seems to work well in general. But new events like dental appointments, doctor appointments, um, Diane has used them with many of her students. Disliked events like for Kyle, the rainbow rug, the um, fire alarm, the um, even going to PE or lunch where it's noisy. Emotionally difficult events, one of the students' um, parents split, and so he was going back and forth between mom and dad. And so they had a really touching book about his time with mom and dad. And mom loves you even though you don't see. You know, I cried practically when I read it. <laughs> um, we provide the family prior to assessment day with, um, with a social narrative. Um, as to what's going to happen. So Pat's a, probably well informed in her summary of social narratives do seem to be meet the criteria for um, being evidence-based practice. And here's the book that we sent home for the last child who came in. On Wednesday morning I'll visit the Sheila Johnson Center so you can actually see our new building. Um, I will work with different people. I'll work on different activities, and this is the actual schedule we made for him. My schedule will show me these people and activities. My schedule may look different than this picture, <laughs> which is important. <laughs> I'll have fun working on many different activities. These may include reading, answering questions, playing with toys. These activities are not like school activities, and I won't get any grades. That was something that came through strong in the interview with Mom. And in fact, um, he did have some real problems. We had to divide the day in two, which I knew we should have in the first place. Um, some things will feel easy. Some things will be a challenge. I don't like. I don't have to do things perfectly. I just have to try my best. I can take breaks. If I want a break, I can say I want a break. I can also point to the break card, which was at the top of his schedule. He, he did. So, some conclusions. Um, visual structure has been helpful for teachers for many years, um, and we're finding that it is particularly helpful in an assessment situation, allowing the child maybe to do their best, maybe to do better than they would do, because it's an unfamiliar situation. They're unfamiliar people. Um, we're changing. We're, we're taking them up to their ceiling where they're failing, um, and then we're starting something over again. It's like the worst possible situation for a, a child with autism. Um, and many other children, as a matter of fact. So um, we find that giving them this way to visually organize their day, let them know what they have to do, how much they've done, um, and when they're ready, and what comes next has been useful.